Hey, what's up my sad stars? Michael Princhak here. Welcome to a video over the top 10 things that you need to know when it comes to unit one, exploring one variable data for AP statistics. I'm talking about 10 things that are definitely going to come up on the AP exam in May and 10 things that should be coming up on your unit one test in class. If you can understand these 10 things, mass these 10 things, you're going to be really, really on track to be successful, hopefully under unit tests and on the AP exam and test in May. So let's dive into them right now. Number one, know how to describe a distribution. This is a huge important topic that's typically going to be on one of the FRQ exam questions. When you describe a different distribution, there are four things. I say four, sometimes it's three, but there are a couple of things that you have to talk about. You got to talk about the shape of the distribution. You got to talk about the center of the distribution. You got to talk about the spread of the distribution and you got to talk about possible outliers. Now, if there aren't any outliers, I guess you don't necessarily have to mention them. That's why there could only be three things, but usually Usually, even if there are no outliers, it's worth mentioning, hey, there are no outliers. Now, if you're given a data display, histogram, dot plot, box plot, something along those lines, there's really not a whole lot you could say without knowing all the individual data. And if you don't have all the individual data, you don't know all of your summary statistics. So if you just have one of those graphs, you got to make sure you talk about the shape, skewed left, skewed right, all that fun stuff, unimodal, bimodal, symmetric. You got to make sure you give one number that you think best represents the center. You got to talk about the spread. What is the range, min to max? Where's the majority of the data? Maybe the min and max is like this, but the majority of the data is over here. Talk about all that kind of stuff and talk about that stuff in context to the problem. Don't just say it is skewed to the right. Say the distribution of men's shirt sizes is skewed to the left. Whatever. Make sure you talk about it in context. Tip number two, make sure you know the different shapes and what they mean for your data. When your data is nice and symmetric, that means, well, a couple different things. If it's unimodal and symmetric or mound shaped and symmetric, it means the majority of your data is in the middle, a little bit of data on the one side, a little bit of data on the other side, nice and symmetric. You can also be symmetric when the majority of your data is on the outsides and very little data in the middle. That's still symmetric, but make sure you know what symmetric means. Skewed left means that the majority of your data is on the right, less of it is to the left, or skewed to the right means the majority of your data is on the left and less of it is to the right. So make sure you recognize those shapes. Typically that could be a multiple choice question or an FRQ where you got to describe the distribution and you need to know, well, if it's skewed left, skewed right, symmetric. Don't forget about bimodal as well. If you see kind of two humps in your data, maybe a hump over here where the females are or a hump over here where the males are, understanding what bimodal means and maybe there's a gap in the middle is a really important characteristic you got to be able to talk about when it comes to understanding shape. If you don't know anything about shape, you're definitely going to be losing some points, let me tell you that. Tip number three, know the difference between the mean and the median. Now, not just the difference in terms of what they are, or how they're found, but be able to compare them. If you have a distribution that is nice and symmetric and unimodal, or actually just symmetric in general, then the mean and the median are going to be very close to each other, right smack dab in the center. But if your data is skewed to the right, then the mean is going to go a little bit higher to the right side, meaning that it's going to be greater than the median. If your data is skewed to the left, the mean is going to get pulled down a little bit lower to the left and the mean is going to be less than your median. So being able to compare the mean and median based on the shape is a huge important topic that is going to be coming up on the AP exam. Tip number four, be able to find the median based on a histogram. Now there is no formula to find the median of a set of data. But we do have a formula to tell you where the median is located. If you take your sample size n plus 1 divided by 2, that will give you a rough idea. Well, that will tell you the location, the actual middle value. But if you have a histogram, you don't actually have all of your values, but you could still count from that histogram to determine where that middle value falls. So if you find out that the middle value falls at the 30th spot or the 30th value, from the bottom, well then you just got to start counting through your histogram. Okay, I got five here, six here, seven here, nine here. And once you get to where the 30th is, you can determine what interval on that histogram contains your median. Now you still can't determine exactly what value the median is, but you know what interval from that histogram the median is located. That is a big question that comes up, I would say almost every single year on the AP exam, making sure that you could see a histogram and find where the median is. Now you could also then incorporate what we just talked 
talked about in tip number three in terms of how does the mean compare to the median. Because once you know where the median is, if you're nice and symmetric, the mean's probably really close by. If you're skewed to the left, the mean is going to be lower. If you're skewed to the right, the mean is going to be higher. So identifying in a histogram where that median falls, super important and actually really easy to do. Tip number five, know the measures of spread. First, we have range, max, minus, min, but honestly not used that often because it's so easily influenced by outliers. We also have the IQR, which is best seen in box plots where we can actually see Q3 and Q1, and it's that middle 50% of the data. But the standard deviation really is the best way to understand spread when it comes to understanding how data varies. Just know that first and foremost, the standard deviation is typically how far data is from the mean. Smaller standard deviation means most most data is clustered near the mean. A larger standard deviation means most data is spread far from the mean. So when a graph looks like this, where most of the data is far from the mean, far on the left, far on the right, it's actually going to have a larger standard deviation. Where a graph looks like this, where most of the data is centered in the middle, near the mean, it's going to have a much smaller standard deviation. Being able to compare the standard deviation just by looking at histograms is a really important concept that often does come up on the AP exam. Tip number six, know how to find and identify outliers in a set of data. This is a huge topic, a huge concept that's bound to come up on the AP exam, whether it be multiple choice or free response, I promise it's going to be there. Now we do have two methods to figure out outliers. The number one method, probably the most preferred, most common method, deals with what we call our fence method. So the upper fence is found by taking Q3 plus 1.5 times the IQR. That's going to give you an upper fence if any data in your your value or any data or any values in your data is larger than that upper fence, it will be deemed an outlier. The lower fence is Q1 minus 1.5 times the IQR. That's going to give you a lower fence value. If any values in your data is less than that lower fence, they're going to be deemed outliers. Now that method is best used if you, well, know your Q3 and Q1 because that's really all you need to know. Now. We love identifying outliers in box plots. When you create your box plot, if you do have any outliers, you got to find them first and then put little asterisks or stars or something by those outliers to just signify that they are in fact outliers. And then the whiskers of your box and whisker plot go to the next highest or lowest value that was not an outlier. Now the second method for identifying outliers is when you have your mean and standard deviation. So maybe you don't even know what your quartiles are, you just know the mean and standard deviation. And this is where you're going to take your mean, you're going to add and you're going to subtract two standard deviations. You're going to go up two standard deviations, down two standard deviations, and that's going to basically create an interval. Numbers in that interval, great. Numbers outside that interval are going to be deemed outliers. Typically it's extremely rare, yeah, I don't want to say rare, but it is unlikely, it's weird if a value is outside of two standard deviations above or below from your mean, hence that's why we could use that method to identify outliers as well. But make sure that if you know your quartiles, probably preferred that we use the fence method, whereas if you know the mean standard deviation, you're going to have to go with the other method. Now it's also important to know that if all you have, this is very common on the AP test, all they give you is like the median and the quartiles and stuff like that, and you're asked, or maybe they give you the five number summary, right? The min, the max, Q3, Q1, and the median. Now if that's all they give you, you can use the upper and lower fence method to find those fences, but the problem is all you know is your min and your max. So you can determine if that max is an outlier, if that max is bigger than the upper fence, it's going to be an outlier, but but there could be more outliers you just don't know because you don't have all of your individual values. So you got to be careful in how you word that. There is at least one outlier at my max, but there could be more, all depending. Same thing if your min is lower than that lower fence, then your min is definitely an outlier, but there could possibly be more outliers you just don't know until you actually have all of your data in front of you. So I see that come up a lot, so make sure you're prepared for that type of question as well. Tip number seven coming at you. This is where we want to make sure that we know how to create a box plot. With that box plot, you need your five number summary, Q1, Q3, median, min, and max. And as I just got done talking, find your outliers first using your fence method. And then it's actually really, really easy to make that box and whisker plot or that box plot. Now in AP stats, we do what's called a modified box plot, which we like to show outliers. Now there have been times where they actually say, don't worry about showing outliers, which is easy. Then your whiskers just go to the min and max. But typically we do show those outliers if there are any. Now all you got to do is put asterisk as those outliers, then your whiskers go to the highest or lowest value that are not outliers, and then you put the box, the edges of the box at Q3 and Q1, and then the median goes somewhere inside that box, not necessarily in the middle.
Now, the most important thing you need to know how to do when you have a box plot is understand what it represents. The five number summary, the box plot, breaks your data down into 25% chunks. 25% of data is between the max in Q3. 25% of data is between Q3 and the median. Another 25% of data is between the median and Q1. And the last 25% of data is between Q1 and the min. Now, wider box or wider whisker doesn't need, mean more data. It means that the data in that range is more spread out. Every one of those chunks has 25% of data in it. The width of the whisker or the width of the box just represents how spread out that data is, which means if we have a box plot, we can also see the shape of our data. Because if one side is more spread out than the other, then it's going to be skewed to that side. So if we have a bunch of data tucked down in here and the other side of data is like, like this, well then our data is going to be skewed one way or the other. Whereas if your median is nice in the middle, the, the width to the left and the width to the right is about the same, then your whisker is about the same, your data is going to be nice and symmetric. So make sure you know quick and easy how to create a box plot and also how to understand one. Now if you are given the data, all of the data, and you're trying to find the fastest way, you know, teachers teach you how to get Q1 and Q3 and the median and all that fun stuff, but listen, if you have a TI-84 calculator, enter all of that data into list one. All you got to do is hit one variable stats and scroll down. You will instantly get Q1, Q3, min, max, and the median all created done for you. It'll make your lives so much easier on the AP exam where you don't have to worry about, all right, I got to find that middle value and then I got to find the middle of the bottom and the middle of the top. I, I, listen, you need to know how to do that and that's great, but on a test when you're trying to crunch for time, please use your calculator to find the five number summary and then all you got to do is make a quick plot of it. Tip number eight, this is usually worth at least one multiple choice question on the AP exam. Make sure you know how transforming your data affects measures of center, measures of Fred, measures of Fred, <laughs> measures of spread, and measures of position. Now, here's the big things you need to understand. When you are multiplying all of your data by the same value, when you're multiplying all your data by the same value, now that's actually the same thing as dividing because when you divide, you can multiply by the reciprocal. That's why usually we just lump multiplication and division together to multiplying. So when you are multiplying every value in your data set by the same value, it affects everything. Measures of center, mean, median, we'll get multiplied by that same value. Range, standard deviation, IQR, they'll get multiplied by those same values. However, when you are adding or subtracting a constant from all of your data, only measures of center, mean and median, will get affected by that addition or subtraction of that constant. You would not add a constant or subtract a constant to the mean, excuse me, to the standard deviation, to the IQR and to the range. Those values will remain exactly the same. So if you have a set of data and you're transforming it by doing something like, I'm going to take every value, I'm going to times it by two and add seven. Everything, mean, standard deviation, IQR, range, all of that, medians, all going to multiply by two. But only measures of center, mean and median, would have that seven added onto them. The addition of seven would not change the range, would not change the standard deviation, would not change the IQR. Please be careful of that. That is always going to come up, usually on a really simple multiple choice question, but you got to make sure you understand that. Tip number nine deals with primarily categorical data. Here's the deal. When you're working with proportions, and we typically work with proportions when we're working with categorical data, like what proportion of people said yes, what proportion of people said maybe, what proportion of people said no. The most important thing is that when you have two different sets of data, like a proportion of people that said yes from my first block class and the proportion of people that said yes from my second block class, you cannot average proportions. You can't be like, well, this class was 10%, this class is 20%, so that means in total it's 15%. Absolutely not. That's because the size of those classes or the size of your samples matter tremendously. You cannot average proportions. So don't get fooled with that. We see that oftentimes a lot on the AP exam where they try to show you a chart where they might show like, like eighth graders 20%, seventh graders 20%. And they say, hey, eighth graders and seventh graders have the same number of kids that said yes. No, no, no. They have the same percent of kids that said yes. But if we don't know that they were equal sample sizes, we can't say for sure that it's the same number of kids that said yes. So when you're working with categorical data, we can work with frequencies, how many. We can also work with percentages or proportions, but we got to be careful not to get them mixed up, especially when we're comparing two or more groups together. Now, I love using proportions to make comparisons. It's a really smart thing, but we've got to be very careful that we don't add or average them together. So make sure you understand that and make sure you understand that counts matter and how to work with all those proportions and whatnot. 
The last tip, the 10th tip, is know how to do normal calculations. Now listen, this video is meant to be a quick video of the top 10 things you need to know for unit one. Oh boy, but there is hours could be spent talking about normal calculations. All I could say is know how to do them. Know how to find z-scores, know how to use those z-scores along with a normal table or with some type of calculator program like on the T84, you got normal CDF, there's tons of websites out there that can help you find proportions above z-scores, proportions below z-scores, all if your data follows a normal distribution. I got tons more videos that deal with normal calculations and, and they're very long and very intricate because there's so many details that go into that. And I hope your teacher, I'd imagine your teacher did a great job of teaching it all to you, but here's the deal. All I'm reminding you of right now with tip number 10 is understand that normal calculations are a huge part of the AP exam. So if you don't know them now, you're going to be in trouble. So make sure you can do all the different types of normal calculations. And if you're trying to look for more help on that, please check out my other YouTube videos. I got a huge playlist with nothing but videos covering normal calculations. It's definitely going to help you. All right, that's it for the top 10 tips from unit one on AP statistics, exploring one variable data. If you know those tips and you understand all of those things I just got done talking about, I truly think you're gonna do great on the AP exam when it comes to unit one, but I also think you're gonna do great on your unit one test in your class. But just know that I didn't go over every teeny tiny, tiny detail of unit one, I just went over what I personally think are the most important things when it comes to preparing for the AP tests and what is going to be on it coming out of unit one. So hopefully they all made sense to you, but don't forget I got tons of other videos out of unit one that go into all of those topics in much, much more detail. So please check them out if you need to. See you in the next video.